Hey Skiers, I'm Jeff from SkiEssentials.com. And I'm Bob, how's it going? Welcome to our widest 2024 ski comparison. We did, what, we did mid 110 underfoot free ride skis. Yep. Saving this category of skis as the true powder boards. Yeah, and really the only outlier is that first one on the wall that could have snuck into... Yeah, because it was sub 115. Yeah, but... It's here now and yep. gives a nice kind of foil for the rest of the skis on this wall. Well, and it's the widest ski that Nordica makes. Right. So it's kind of nice to like pull it into this collection. And yep. I believe we had Unleashed 108 and we, Enforcer 110 right. in the narrower wide comparison. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we've talked about this category before just in general. I personally find that when you get up into this width range just because of the application it can be harder to find differences in their feel yeah but there are a lot of differences in their shape and their construction and their weight and their flex pattern and like whether they use taper or no taper so pretty fun discussion yeah this one is a good one to have the scale in it's i think important one. we'll yeah. see a, a pretty big variation in weights especially yeah the high end of these skis are, are, are pretty hefty. Yep, yep. So, any other uh, profound thoughts before we just get right into it? N not really. You know, you had mentioned taper, and I think that's an interesting one, yeah. especially when you see something that's kind of more torpedo looking yep. at the top exactly. of an M free versus some of the more rounded or even just, I don't even know what to call this, this shape here at the top, but like, Double you know, just point, kind of how pointy. Yeah, yeah. kind of how the, <laughs> these manufacturers just, you know, the the last thing, the finishing, yeah, the finishing move here is pretty interesting to see how they de how they deal with it. Yeah, no, some cool skis up here for sure. Um, turn radius. I don't know if I mentioned that, but that's pretty interesting too. Yeah, there's wild variations here as well. Yeah, and as we go through, we can we can discuss like how all those changes affect a ski like this in deep snow. Yep. So. With that said, let's get things started. This is the ski that Bob was referring to over here. Um, this is the Unleashed 114. So could have snuck into that 115 and, and narrower comparison. Um, and kind of an interesting one to start with because I feel like this ski differs quite a lot from <clears throat> at least most of the skis on your side of the wall. We are going narrowest to widest if you didn't pick up on that. Um, and it feels silly to say that there's any all mountain performance in a ski that's 114 underfoot, but this is probably the, the one that has the best, or at least it's right, right up right up there. Yeah, I'd agree. Um, so Nordica Unleashed 114, they started with the narrower Unleashed, the 98 and the 108. They have the 92, but it doesn't really fall under the same conversation right. as the rest of them. And then for 2024, we got this 114. Um, and I feel like we both thought it was kind of an interesting direction for Nordica to go. The 108 is already kind of like a lot of ski for its shape and yeah. its width and its construction and all that stuff. So on paper, the way that this ski is marketed as like a wide freestyle powder ski, you might think it's super, super playful, playful and agile, but I don't necessarily find that. I find that it has some precision to it as well. Yeah. So. Lightweight performance wood core in this ski, and then we get that terrain specific metal. So, kind of interesting going through the skis that have metal and those that don't. So, full metal in the shovel yep. and the tail, which like kind of affects its swing weight, I think. Certainly, when you factor in the, the rocker as well. Yeah. Where we see more pressure on the tips and tails yep coupled with the metal is going to totally make this thing stand out yeah totally so that metal then tapers kind of into the middle of the ski we've talked about this plenty before and then goes full width again underfoot and then basically does the same exact thing in the tail of the ski 2140 grams so that might sound heavy but i would actually say in this category it's it's not for, um, for metal too yep for yeah. metal it's like that's that's not not bad whatsoever. This is a, a 186, so pretty big ski here, um, and it's like pretty reasonably stiff. It's not stiff stiff, but there's 
some ski here yep. for sure. Uh, and then shape is really important. So it is 100% a twin tip, like it's a twin tip powder ski. Decent amount of rocker, but not like, certainly not the most. Right. We'll look at a lot of skis with way longer rocker than that. And then same is true in the tail. In fact, you get even less rocker in the tail. And there's not like a tremendous amount of taper. So you get pretty wide tips and tails here. Um, I'm curious what the, this is a 20.4 meter turn radius. So actually one of the shorter turn radii that we'll look at on this wall, I believe. Now that I say that, I'm second guessing myself, but yeah, it's certainly it's on pretty, the shorter close, side yeah. of the spectrum. Um, and yeah, I just find this ski really interesting because it is very playful. It's very fun to ski. You can do like playful, dynamic, free ridey powder skis on powder ski things on it, but you have to be a really good skier. Yep. It's like they basically built like an athlete level ski and just kind of like slotted it into their line. But that's yeah. really how I think about this ski is. I don't see an application for this ski here in Stowe. I just feel like it's it's too much. Where like when I go this wide around here, I need more like more surf, you know, like right. from something like a Mindbender 116 that's just so easy to smear and surf even in deep snow. There are a ton of accomplishments for the Unleashed 114. It's strong, it's dynamic, it's precise, it's responsive, it's trustworthy, but it's it's not like necessarily easy no it's a lot and like you said having that athlete inspiration and we are seeing this one free ride world tour exactly upper level yeah. you know free ride big mountain events so that seems to be more where the application is versus something that's for the every the person masses. looking for a wider yeah. twin tip yeah and i would i would say that the unleashed 108 if you if you love the unleashed line if yeah. you love the story behind it the 108 is like plenty of width for most people, yeah, and it, it, it is, I find it, uh, there's a difference going from the 108 to the 114. I find the one the 108 a little bit easier to, to manipulate. Yeah, and we've talked about how the Unleashed are, are very good turning skis. Oh, they're great. And this yeah. one still fits into that yeah. category. Yeah, you can make like carves on it. Yeah, you can make carves on it, but yep. boy, it feels like it's it's taking you for a ride. Like yep. if you let it go, it's, re it's noticeable that there's something on your feet with that ski. Yep. Yeah, pretty interesting one to start yep. with, and and honestly quite different than this next ski. Yeah, very opposing here between that 114 and this Bacon 115. Uh, this is another new ski for line this year, and basically, yeah, I like it when Jeff does that and feels the the, the, the flex. Um, you know, we talked about the new uh, Bacon 108 earlier in probably one of our videos. I can't remember. I now believe which, the last but... one that we did, or not the last one that we did, but the one that had the Unleashed 108. Yeah. So pretty similar. We're again just bumping up in measurements. There's a lot of the new Chronic 94 and 101 influence here, but it's following more of the Bacon build to it. So we do have that uh, blend of lighter weight woods in this thing, and it does make it pretty soft when we see the maple incorporated in here as well. So we've talked about that with the Bacon 108, how their, the use of the maple is really accentuating the flex of the ski, totally differing it from what we saw with Unleashed and that stiffer flex with metal. Uh, this Bacon is certainly on the more playful and maneuverable side of the spectrum. They're even like pretty close in weight. They're close in weight. The difference here, and we've talked about this with Chronic more, I think. I think it's more well known, just in the thickness of the core profile. So they're playing with thick and thin. So thin tips and tails, and then thick underfoot. So they're really kind of putting more of that mass kind of in the central, I don't know, third of the ski here. And that's making those tips and tails extremely maneuverable. You know, flexing them certainly has that really bendy flex to it as well. But yeah, thin tip technology, really just going from top sheet to base material here in the very front and the very back of the ski. But yeah, a lot of that mass is in the middle. So it feels like relatively sturdy underfoot, but has that, has that capability of being maneuverable. And we're gonna see more rocker in this thing than in that Unleashed. Starts down a little bit further 
not quite as much splay. You don't need it as much when they're so bendy. You know, the flex of the ski is going to allow that thing to, to bend up and really plane over the ski. Um, and then pretty similar in the tail, you know, pretty darn symmetrical uh, profile here in this one. Yep. And then just that rounder taper shape overall, you know, very much in that playful zone, kind of the rounder you see, especially in the tails, uh, the more we're kind of leaning towards that playful, creative free ride style of skiing. And nose, that's nose butters. Yeah. It's like a, it's like a butter, butter zone. And that's what softer flex. And that's what line is known for is just yeah. making like these interesting, unique skis. And we'll see it again with Pescado. Um, I don't see a stated radius on this one here, um, but it looks long. Looks in the 20s to me. We'll throw it up on the screen. Yeah. Um, uh, line just uh, announced that Bacon 122 Tom Wallace pro model. Like all the videos on, like the algorithm has definitely found that I'm interested in. In a Bacon 122. In a Bacon 122. Yeah, same with me. Yeah. They must be putting some social media advertising dollars behind yeah. that stuff. Um, so, yeah, if you want like kind of the same, the same story, but you want even wider, they have that option now too. And it's, it's just really interesting. Like on paper, like you could easily go to any website, like we don't necessarily differ like we don't our categorization doesn't go all the way down to like freestyle powder ski right but if it did the unleashed 114 and the bacon 115 would both be on that page yeah isn't that funny yeah, yeah. and they're like they're very different yep so like i i think of this as like not necessarily slower speed but maybe that's a good way to think about it slower speed and like jibby bouncy right. and jibby and playful where unleashed 114 to me is like higher speeds you're going big you're like yeah. landing and charging out of it and stuff like that yeah but again fat twin tip really fun to really fun to see uh how they're kind of taking their new technology from chronic 94 up to i'm not sure if the 122 has this believe same, it's all the, I believe it's all the same yeah. as wider but yeah um, you know, clearly it works in terms of spreading out the, yeah. the emphasis on where the stability yeah. is. Yes, I like that it feels like a, a pretty consistent collection, yep. too, all the way from 94 up through 122. It's yep. like, it's, it's easy to understand what the skis are going to be like. Um, next ski up here is the Elan Ripstick 116. Uh, this thing's pretty darn interesting. The next three skis at least that I get to talk about. So that being Ripstick, Ranger, and Mindbender. To me, those three actually feel like some of the most well-rounded skis on this whole wall. Yeah. And like, if you're, I don't exactly know the right way to, to phrase this. If you're an average consumer shopping for a powder ski, this is a great place to be. This is a great place to be. This is a great place yeah. to be. Where a lot of things on this wall feel like they have more specific applications. Yeah, I agree. Like, yeah. I'm a free ride skier and I want a heli ski that's slashy. Or like, I want to do nose butters off wind lips. Yeah. I'm going to go get a Bacon 115. Like, this is just like, I'm a skier and I want a good powder ski. Yep. So, anyways. Um, tube light wood core in this ski. We get those carbon rods. We get amphibio profile. All the ripstick ingredients are found in this 116. As is often true with ripsticks, a little bit lighter than what we've looked at so far. We'll call it 2,060 grams. It's hovering between 60 and 70 right now. Um, this is a 185, so we're pretty consistent with at least unleashed. Um, and I want to look at the shape here in a second, but before we do, I think the it's interesting in the ripsticks when you get up this wide because they get a little stiffer. Yeah, again, they kind of experiment with that thickness of the profile as well. Where yeah. they're just, they're putting more material in there. Yeah, and, and like we find that with the, the 96 to the 106. Yeah, like the, the 10... regular 106. Yeah. Like it's pretty stiff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And like I feel like it could be like a little bit counterintuitive where when you look up into 116 as a, a width, your mind just goes to like playfulness. Like right. you would think the progression would kind of be like the opposite, but it's sort of not. So I don't think the ski is hard to handle, but I think it can actually 
handle high speeds and aggressive skiing better than narrower rip sticks. Yeah. Like there doesn't need to be a 116 black edition. Would nope. You, would you agree? I would agree. So pretty interesting. Nice supportive, like I wouldn't call it stiff, but it's supportive and, and snappy and, and reliable. Um, and then love the shape in this ski as a powder ski. So that's where the rocker starts, Bob. I mean, it's that's long. <laughs> You, and you, know, you totally. can definitely see as ripstick progresses how that changes as well as the, oh, as the taper. Yeah, so very, very long tip rocker here. And then there is quite a lot of splay for a directional ski, but it is still a directional ski. Totally. So like where Bacon was, was much more symmetrical in its rocker profile, this is truly directional, which to me, helps place it in that well-rounded category. Like, if you're not landing switch in powder, which yeah. is something that, like, 0.002% of skiers can right. physically Ever do, do. Yeah. <laughs> then, like, this is, this is a great place to be. Um, Bob, you mentioned that taper shape. I think that helps a ton, too. And, like, I feel like everything that we like about ripsticks carries over into this ski. It's just in a powder format. So it's very intuitive. It's pretty darn easy to ski. The Amphibio profile like helps a ton. Yeah. Like it just keeps your skis tracking together regardless of the snow conditions. And just like you don't have to work as hard to get that to happen. And yeah, I just think it's a great ski. Um, I'd say it's it's even light enough that if you're looking for a powder touring ski, you know, yeah. they include this this skin attachment notch on the tail. So it could work really well for that too. Um, and, you know, interestingly, I'm kind of just being reminded by it right now, pretty big range of mount points on this thing. Yeah, Alon's funny like that, how they don't seem to be too keyed into the yeah. whole mount point thing, yet they have that, that big range, you know, plus they have a six, is it a six centimeter range? Yeah. No, on the seven. side wall? Seven. Seven. So and Plus three or minus four. Yeah. And I'd say the plus three is probably still three back from true center, but that's more centered than like I would have guessed. Right. If you had asked me what the furthest forward mount point is on a Ripstick 116. Probably. Seems far forward for a more directional ski like this. I kind of agree. Yeah. I don't think I would do that. I think I would probably draw the line at like plus one, Yeah. if anything, just because we looked at the difference between tip and tail rocker and you don't want to be too far forward. No, and when, you know, when we've skied it, we've been on the line, and it feels really cohesive and nice. Yeah. So um, Glad you mentioned skiing, because I was going to talk about that in the intro. We've skied pretty darn sure all of these skis, except, like, I've never skied the last one. I don't know about the Armada, about the Armada either. I've skied this guy. Okay. So we've skied <laughs> everything up here, but we've talked about this before. The logistics of filming on powder days right. is very challenging, especially eight, nine, twenty skis. Totally, or however many. It's here. it's yeah. a nightmare. Yeah, everything takes longer. Cameras get wet. Yeah, it, it's just it's challenging. <laughs> <laughs> so you won't see quite as much skiing footage in this comparison as as you may be accustomed to. And our apologies. I wish. I wish we could make it happen. I wish we had yeah. beautiful powder powdery footage of yeah. all of these skis, but it just doesn't happen to be the case. No. Bob, you found um, a lot to like in this guy. This is another kind of funny algorithm discussion where like all of a sudden last year, this guy Cole Richardson started popping up on my feeds. I don't know if you had the same experience. I've been slightly more aware of Cole Richardson for a longer period of okay. time than you. I didn't, I didn't know who he was. And all of a sudden Art we spirit. get like these videos of this kid just absolutely hammering these big mountain lines, big jumps, big drops on Some a core 117. Yep. And we're like, wow, that's pretty impressive that this guy's doing this stuff on a core 117. And lo and behold, the next year he's got his name on a ski, you know, this the widest oblivion, this uh, 116 and like, and, you know, I couldn't be happier for the guy. Yeah, it's, it's you know, really like, cool to see. Yeah. I ran into him this past summer in Whistler. Very friendly young man. Yep. Um, was, was keen to talk about Oblivions. And yep. Yeah, I'm psyched, psyched that he's got a ski that I think is going to work perfectly for him. 
Yeah, I mean, Oblivions have always been kind of on the narrower side of the profile, starting down at the 79 right. and going 84, 94. And then for this year, we get 102 and 116. Um, this is the big one. This is like the, the pro model. This is what he's going to be skiing on instead of the, instead of the core, um, which we have in the written setup. We didn't have it for film time. Would have loved to include that because that's a really good yeah. one. Yeah, and we really spent a considerable one. amount of time on it last season. Yeah. Um, but this one is really interesting. Basically, following kind of the, the, the concepts of the narrower oblivions and then putting uh, kind of a, a higher performance and ecological spin on it in yeah, terms of sure. construction. Um, we're getting a lightweight wood core, two sheets of carbon, and then uh, the vertical stringer of PET, that recycled plastic. So basically just taking a lighter weight material, making it a little bit more environmentally friendly, and putting it in the center of the ski. So pretty interesting in terms of what they're doing in construction. If you can make a ski that performs equally as well with a lower footprint, then great. Um, the other big story here is the turn shape. Um, before we get to that, just 20, 2050 grams, right about ripstick, um, ripstick weight there. Yeah, and um, I'm, before you go into turn radius, I don't think I ever mentioned this is 20.4. Okay. So kind of on the on the short side on again. On the turnier side. Yep. Uh, this one's on the longer side. It's amazing when you look down at it. The thing looks dead straight. Looks pretty darn straight. Um, so this is the longer length. This is the 189, and it has a 30.8 meter yeah, that, turn that radius. That sounds right. Um, I know it's on one of them written in black on black, which I can't read. Yeah, 30.8, so almost 31 meter turn radius. And when we were kind of talking about it earlier, what does that do for for your skiing? Having something that's 10 meters longer than that Elan or the Nordica, uh, it basically puts more emphasis on you, the skier, as to dictating that shape and duration, uh, including sideways stuff. So yeah. Uh, it's just it super really easy well. to get sideways, yep. and it's slightly counterintuitive to think that something with such a long turn radius is easy to get sideways, but if you think about it, it's not hooking. So a ski with a shorter turn radius is going to want to hook in and make a rounder turn, whereas this in a straighter cut is going to want to just pivot and go sideways a lot easier. So you're getting that ability out of a longer turn shape. And I think that's beneficial for skiers that are interested in manipulating the turn shape and style more than letting the ski do it for you. And I think the Unleashed is kind of the example on the other end of the spectrum where yep. it's just, it, it's gonna wanna hook in and it's gonna wanna make a turn. But this one's a little bit different. Um, and then like the other Oblivion skis, there's not a whole lot of taper going on here. Um, you know, the edge, I mean, it would have to, you know, to achieve that turn radius. So. Uh, you know, the widest part of the ski is very much towards the front. Um, not terribly dramatic rocker in this one. You know, it's certainly far more rockered skis on here. And somewhat symmetrical in terms of that profile in the tail as well. But again, not a lot of taper. You know, you're just not going to get it out of a straight ski like this. So really interesting construction and shape. Certainly sets it apart from the other skis on this wall. Kind of interesting to see, like, you know, I feel like we, we were talking about Unleashed 114 being somewhat athlete driven, and I yep. would say this is 100% athlete driven. Interesting to see both of them not use a tremendous amount of rocker. Right. Which is perhaps reflective of how good professional skiers are. Right, they don't need it. They're like, I yeah. don't need rocker, like yep. I need camber for yep. landings and stuff like that. So I yeah. just thought that was interesting. And like, Kind of like that ripstick, we do get carbon in this one, so it does have a little bit more stiffness, really consistent flex in this ski. Yeah, um, you can bend it. Yeah. Um, I can't remember who it was, but somebody, I think it was a head athlete or somebody, recently posted a, a clip of just like turning on this. I saw that, yeah. And yeah, it looked great. They're bending it quite yep. a lot. And I thought that was like, that was a cool visual. I right. was like, yeah, it's really straight, but like it's not, it's not just a plank, you know, right. there's... There's some uh, manipulation available here. Yeah, but very excited to see this new ski come through for 2024. Yeah, you, you took a, a strong liking to this one. Yep, 
Yeah, just more of that traditional style, yeah. which I think is pretty interesting. Yep. Um, and the next ski is one that that I have quite a lot of fondness for. This is the Ranger 116, and I feel like I've mentioned this before, but <clears throat> I really like the Rangers. I really like the 96. I really like the 102. I really like the 116. There's one that I left out that I don't, <laughs> don't particularly mesh well with, that being the 108. Um, it just has like a little bit too much of like a big mountain vibe to yeah. me. So I find it interesting that like, at least for me, the 116 shares more, more like feelings with the 102. I just think that's like an interesting thing that I've experienced. Oh, this is my favorite Ranger. Is it? Yep. Perfect. So it's built the same. We got a poplar and beech wood core in this ski. We get shaped TI underfoot, but I feel like in this ski, it's so short that like, it's almost just for binding retention. It's definitely adding a bit of like vibration damping and strength just underfoot, but it's not extending much into the, the rest of the ski no. whatsoever. It doesn't like hinder the flex at all, like the narrower ones where that yeah. metal kind of extends into exactly. the flexibility zone. And I don't know if you've noticed on this, but that notch, the... Yep, sorry, it's the, huge. It's huge. The flex cut. The flex cut, thank you. It doesn't even say that on here. That was just straight yeah. out of memory. Nice. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a lot bigger on this ski than it is yep. in the other Ranger skis. Yep, so I just find this ski feels like it has a massive sweet spot to me, yeah. which is similar to how I feel when I ski the 102. Um, 2,150 grams, so kind of middle of the road for weight, uh, and a really nice, like, pretty soft flex pattern. Yeah, the shovel, is, the shovel is really soft on this thing. Yeah. Which, I, which is one of the reasons why I like this one is because it's got a little bit more of that consistent round flex. Yeah. So... I find it like very, very, very easy to release the tail yeah. edge because of that flex combined with a pretty substantial amount of rocker. It is more like that ripstick shape because it is a fully directional ski. Yeah. So long, long tip rocker up here and then decent amount of splay again, but from a length perspective, just not nearly as much tail rocker, but still like this is plenty of tail rocker for a ski this wide in my opinion and paired with a, a decent amount of kind of smooth early taper and yeah I just find it it's very very smooth and supple it has good vibration damping just from the build like yeah. I think all the Rangers have pretty good vibration damping um, it feels like surfier and smearier to me than the Ripstick 116 which you know I put into that kind of category of very, very well-rounded powder skis. So just something to think about if you're kind of choosing between, especially between those three skis, is Ripstick's going to be more energetic, a little bit more responsive. Uh, this ski kind of like, doesn't feel like it's glued to the snow surface, but I'd say gives you a better, smoother connection yeah. to the snow surface. But really fun, very easy to handle. Not hard to ski at all. That 108, um, I hit a tree when I skied it. Yeah, you're never gonna, never gonna like it again. Probably not. <laughs> Just had a, a, <laughs> an unfortunate mishap on it. Yeah. Um, but I just, you know, I, I find this ski easier to bend, a little easier to control, and, and just a lot of fun every time I get to ski it. Yeah. No, I agree. I think that that with Fisher, with the Ranger, that kind of what they intended to do is. Highlighted in the 116. I think so. Yeah, and the 102. Yeah, um, I know I I get along better with the 102 than than you do. And and in Fisher's defense, I think if I lived out west, I would love the 108. Right. I just don't. We don't have the the ideal terrain. Yeah. For that ski. Yeah, this one I like this. A little bit of an outlier here. Yeah, and I have some some thoughts about this one too. Um, this is the Armada ARV JJ116, and this is the ultralight version. So they do have an ARV116 heavy version. Yep. And so this shares pretty much all the same footprint and technology, just with a lightweight Karuba wood core, and that's it. So they've really pared down the construction. 
uh, put in lighter weight wood and just made it a lot easier to ski. And as a result, um, more playful, more mobile, more maneuverable, you know, and in a vacuum, uh, a lighter thing is going to float better than a heavier thing. So if you're, you know, if you're not terribly aggressive, I think that this is going to be a better choice for a lot of different skiers. Yeah, I think like that, that's, yeah, totally. There's like a few like really ideal applications. One yeah. is a less aggressive skier. The other is like freestyle ski touring. Right. Which is like an interesting <laughs> niche yeah. of, of, of yeah. skiing. Yep. Um, but we're under 2,000 grams. I think this is our first sub 2,000 gram ski. You know what, Bob? It might be the only. Nope. I have, you have at least one more. You have full there. confidence? Yep. Okay. Um, 1,882 grams here. And one of the other cool things about it is how we're getting their smear tech technology in the tips and tails. Eerily similar, Jeff, to what we're seeing in fellow Ammer sports ski atomic bent Chetler 120. With now, their Horizon now tech. hold on just a second. Okay. I believe both technologies existed before Armada was absorbed under the Ammer umbrella. All right. So I don't think we can, like, be. Well, then can we blame this on that? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. I think they were developed independently. They just happened to be pretty similar. But they're, they both work. So they're like, very similar. An engineer out there, a like couple different you... engineers out there had the same school of yeah. thought, and it turns out that it works. <laughs> it does work. I don't think that's an unreasonable scenario. No, I don't either. I just like to look for You like to create conspiracy theories? I do. Yeah, it's kind of fun. Um, but at any rate, edges end right about here, and that's where smear tech, so they're thinning the profile in the very edges and just creating a more, uh, sur they're creating more surface area without adding width, which really just gives this thing a real smeary attitude. And, eh, you know, with that bacon, it's pretty soft. Pretty darn soft. Yep. So we're seeing that nice flex in the tips and in the tails here, and it just really accentuates the playfulness of the ski, like to a huge degree. It's another nose butter ski right there. Right. And it's you know I like how they are making the edges end like really early on yeah. in the ski. Um, it just Me makes too. sense. And then there are step down sidewalls here as well, so it goes from half cap, quarter cap to full cap and that's where the rocker starts is at the full cap section so we're getting a lot of splay here and then add that flex and these things will just pop right out of the snow yeah and similar in the tail as well so we're anytime you see something that's falling more on the symmetrical side of the spectrum like jeff said we're adding in that freestyle component that creative skiing ability and that's where these things really stand out is in natural features and you know Big powder hits. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a jib touring ski. Right. <laughs> <laughs> just, that's my favorite way to define skis like yeah. that. But it is like a really good way to think about it. Like if you're like, if you like building backcountry jumps. Yeah. Great option. Because it's not going to tire you out. Like whether you're boot packing or whether you're skinning to the yeah. zone where you're building the jump. But then like, you know, it's got sidewall underfoot. There's some stability and strength in there so yeah i think it's a that's that's the best way to think about it and i feel like the relatively symmetrical shape i think it's fair to say that 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 takes it away from a directional skier as yep. like as of course it's an option but are there better options for a directional skier i would generally argue yes yeah and you were just mentioning that symmetrical shape i mean then it's 185 it's 139, 116, uh, 139, 116, 135. Yeah. So, so that, only a four millimeter drop from tip to tail. Right, which is, that's, that's very close to symmetrical yeah. being that wide. And that's kind of what we'll get to when we get to uh, the white ski here as well. So pretty interesting, 18 meter turn radius. So it's gonna turn. Most of that radius is found in that central third of the ski. Yeah. You can actually see it when you just held it like that, like the tips and tails get really straight. Right. I mean, that taper is very low yep. on the ski for sure. Yep. Yeah, cool ski. No, I think so too. I haven't really had too much experience skiing or even looking at it until this. And Yeah, I've skied at a handful of like Pico, yep. um, Waterville, 
industry demo situations and it's it's fun yeah it's super playful super easy to ski and like i you know i kind of have the the right background for it sure so then it just ends up working um this is another one of those well-rounded directional powder skis that i i really like i think like I think they did a great job. You know, like the past three skis that you've talked about, Bob, have been like pretty specific right. in like their design and their application. And I feel like Ripstick Ranger and this Mindbender, just great choices. Very, very easy. You know, like what we often say in other comparisons, if you don't know what ski to buy, just get one of these. And like these three feel like they fall right into that category. Totally. So wood core in this ski carbon spectral braid so it is part of the mindbender c series which is now a whole series 90 all the way through 116 yep. with like two new skis in there for us 2100 grams um and it is like fully a directional shape which it, you know it'd be interesting like it would take too much time to look at all the tail rocker right away but i wonder if this has the least amount of tail rocker Maybe by I mean, split. it's long, but it's, yeah, it's yeah. low. Yeah. Um, the Pescado might have something to say about that. That's a very good point. Uh, another one of those skis that's like not stiff, but I find this has a really nice supportive flex pattern. Um, I got to ski this ski on a great day with K2 this past season when we were taking some photos and filming, and I had a great time on it. Um, I really appreciate all the Mindbender C skis, but this one might be my favorite. I don't know. I, I mean, that day I was on the 106, and it was, it was just lovely. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a nice kind of mix to the Mindbenders in terms of playfulness and performance. Yeah. And I think that this one it has that mix. has that mix as well. Totally. So, again, pretty decent tip rocker up here. Not a tremendous amount of splay, and I think that's kind of important in this ski because they counteract that with some really nice taper and kind of like roundness to this portion of the, the side cut. Like it gives you a good connection and a lot of control, but never yeah. feels like it's stuck in a turn. You can always break free from a turn, um, which is I think unique and a, and a cool accomplishment for not having much splay. And then, yeah, same thing back here in the tail. So decent length, but yeah, the rise back here, there's just not much. And again, that's like kind of giving you this nice connection to the snow without feeling like you're stuck. Yeah. It's always easy to release the tail edge on this ski. Um, it's relatively light, you know, in this category. So it's not overly fatiguing. Um, kind of talked about the differences in feel between Ripstick here and Ranger. I feel like the mind bender is basically right in between. So it's not yeah. quite as snappy or energetic as the ripstick, nor is it as damp and supple as the ranger, but it has a nice mix of kind of both of those characteristics. Um, and yeah, really good ski. I think it's great to see it kind of trickle down into the 106 because there's a bigger application for the 106. There's yeah. more people that can buy that and justify it, but this is a good one. And I would say this would be a, not to say it's, it can't be a West Coast powder ski, but I would say for somebody that lives here in Stowe, if you want a really wide ski to put in your quiver for those special days that we get infrequently, yeah, this would be a good one. And I think like that's kind of, I felt the same way about, about Ripstick and Ranger here. And very soon we will be entering into a world where I don't see much of an East Coast application. Right. So, Mindbender 116C, great ski. Yeah, and one of the better looking Mindbenders, I would say. I love this Both one. top and bottom. Not that I'm wearing like the correct branded sweatshirt, but it sure matches my sweatshirt nicely. The well, sidewalls. And I don't know if you remember, I have an outfit that exactly matches the Ranger 116. I, I do my, remember my that. My green 686 pants Kessley and sweatshirt. my Kessley sweatshirt. And, yeah. And I'm exactly color-coded to the Ranger 116. They gotta, like, these brands need to get together and come up with some co coordinate outfits. these things. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> is this the ski that we're, you're saying is sub 2,000 grams? I believe it is, but I, there's others as well. So this one I remember being light, but not lightest. 
Uh, this is a DPS Lotus Duh. 117. Duh. I know, it's, it's right there at 2,000. <laughs> so it's... No, it's under. It's jumping. It's under 2,000, though, for sure. Yeah. 1980. 1980. Uh, this one basically uses the older Alchemist construction, so a blend of poplar, polonia, and beech, or I'm sorry, ash in the wood core. Uh, really kind of mixing and being sophisticated with where the wood is located, even putting like the ash insert into the center of the ski and then keeping it lighter on the edges. So interesting blend. And then we get there two carbon laminates as well, really just stiffening this thing and making it very consistent from tip to tail. When you put them in wider, so if you think about like the, the carbon in, um, what is it now, the or it used to be the Pagoda like piece 90 or something like that, narrower, then it starts to get a little bit more flexible. As it gets wider, you're just going to lose some of it just due to spreading that material out. Is Kaizen the word you were looking for? Well, Kaizen is, but now that, that only goes down to 100. Right. So I was looking for something narrower. I think you picked the correct comparison. Okay, good. Um, but yeah, this one basically has the old Alchemist construction and then the Lotus turn shape is more similar to C2 than RP, or rather, what is it now? Rocker and something else. I don't know, don't get me confused Sorry. with DPS names. Um, but yeah, really confused. 21 meter turn radius in this Lotus, uh, and a real dramatic view into the world of taper. So super thin tips and then widens down here very much on that dramatic side of the spectrum. If you kind of oppose it with the, uh, with, the, with the Oblivion 116, where this plane basically would just go straight. Um, so this distance here on this Lotus is really, really accentuated. Uh, and that just makes for smooth flotation in the snow. So it really gives you good rise when the widest part is brought down into the ski. Uh, allows the, this part to basically continue, you know, unmolested through the snow, and then you get into the float. Uh, so that's going to make it really pop out. They do keep it kind of straight in the middle, you know, when we're looking at the kind of what you think of DPS in terms of really dramatic rocker with a, with a short turn shape. This lotus shape is a little bit different. So it is straighter in the underfoot zone. There's not a whole lot of dramatic side cut there. And that's going to Again, pointing to that 116 Oblivion, kind of make it feel like you can dictate it a little bit better. It doesn't feel quite as hooky or as turny as some of the, as Unleashed or, uh, what is that, Bacon there? Uh, like it won't just jump into the turn, it'll ease into it. And then taper in the tail as well, starts well back into the ski and then just nice gradual shape into the tail. Not a whole lot of splay going on back here. So that does give it a little bit more of that energy that is, you know, interesting. We don't really talk about getting back to the lift all that much, but you know, if you want to ski that does turn on non-fresh powder, like having something with that flatter tail does help. So that's where this thing kind of comes in hand. Uh, but overall, really, really floaty, especially due to that dramatic taper and the use of carbon. So pretty interesting ski from DPS. I could see you owning a Lotus 117. You know, they, I forget what the bigger one is. They got a much bigger one that would have gone... Over there. Like yep. through the wall. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Do you want that one instead? If I'm going to... Yeah. If I'm going to be on a, a really 117 or higher, then yeah, Just probably. Go all the way there. Yep. Just put it in your quiver for all your heli skiing trips. All of them. All zero? Yep. <laughs> They're coming. But great, great skis. I mean, I, you know, I really like these carbon powered skis, DPS, yeah. um, the heads. They just kind of fit my style a little bit where I like the agility and power without the extra weight. And that's kind of what I find is a benefit for, for that Lotus skier. Yep. Um, <clears throat> Moving on to Black Ops 118, very different ski. Totally. Uh, so this is, we're back to another kind of athlete-inspired ski here. You can thank Chris Logan and Parker White for the existence of this ski. Uh, two fantastic skiers, both very, very strong. 
both known for skiing fast and going big. And if you didn't know anything else about this ski, if you take that information home, you have a good, good sense of what this ski is all about. It's stiff and it's strong and it's powerful and it's supportive for a professional skier who likes to ski really, really fast. Interestingly, the build is pretty simple. So poplar wood core on this ski, we get rubber in the tips and tails. In fact, you can feel it. There's like a substantial a amount chunk, of, yeah. of rubber up there. Um, and then just fiberglass. So like the recipe isn't too complex, uh, but I would say the result of those things is, is pretty darn impressive. So 2,550 grams in this Black Ops 118. So that's a lot of ski. It's a lot of weight. And yeah. like it's, it's heavy enough that if you're not a physically strong skier, don't even think about it. I, I actually really like this thing as much as I just talked about how I like the light and mobile skis. I, I like this ski too. I had a blast on it, it just, last year. It is, it's a bit of a handful just yeah. from the weight perspective. But I think that is countered by a few things. So it's not like leg breaking stiff which helps yeah. a ton. In fact, like the amount that you can bend the tail down there is really nice to have. So it's not like, it's not so stiff that it's gonna kill you or wear you out like super, super fast. I think that's just coming from the weight. It also has a lot of rocker and a lot of splay. So maybe not like the longest tip rocker that we've looked at, but a very rounded shape to its rocker. And, that's going to help you float a lot. It's also going to basically reduce the length of your effective edge in anything but the deepest snow conditions. Yep. And I think that helps a lot. And then really like the same is true in the tail here. So we get a lot of splay in the tail. There isn't much taper really, but there's enough splay back here that with the kind of compliant flex pattern, I think that helps helps quite a bit. You know, if it didn't have, if it was flatter and if it was stiffer with this weight, it would be punishing. Yeah. But because they build in that reasonable flex in the rocker profile, I actually think it's really fun to ski. Um, this length, this is the 186, this has a 25 meter turn radius. Nice so and long. We're not quite like oblivion length and yeah. turn radius, but it is, yeah, it's, it's pretty darn long. So. Really, I, to me, the best way to think about this ski or, or who should be skiing it is speed. Like, I, I think it's best for somebody who skis really fast and needs a ski that's going to be supportive of that, but it still allows you to do, like, super playful things. So it's kind of like Oblivion, where, like, it's going to go sideways really well because it's not tremendously shaped. It's going to let you drift and skid and smear and, and dump speed if you need to. Yeah. You'll see Rosignol athletes do really impressive backcountry jump tricks on this ski, um, and it absolutely can do that. You just have to remember that weight. Like, I would feel a little bit uncomfortable spinning on, on this weight, but that's me, and I'm closer to, like, 160 pounds yeah. rather than I would venture a guess that Chris Logan's 200 plus, more like your size. Yeah. So, really cool ski. And you, you skied it and had a blast. Yeah, last year, rosing all day, we had some good snow. Um, you know, it wasn't like deep, like nope. five, six inches, something like that. Yeah, but I'd like, say that's accurate. Um, and even like not on the intended application, I mean, on gondolier, which is just a long blue groomer, but the snow gets chopped up pretty quick. And like you were talking about speed, and we had this experience the other day in heavy snow here at Stowe, like, what's the play here? Do we right. do you go, go slow and make turns, or do you kind of use your momentum? And let it run. And that thing is ideal for letting, using the momentum and letting, it, letting run. it run. Absolutely. Like, you know how when you're skiing and then there's a bump, and you're like, oh, should I absorb this or, or go? Right. And that ski was like, just go. Well, and it, because it absorbs it on its own. Yeah. yeah. But I remember, like, as heavy as it is, feeling fairly unweighted on the ski because you can yes. just 
skip over stuff. Yes. So it's an interesting contrast. No, and I think that's that's kind of what I was getting at. I think it's really important that they counter the weight with yeah. a reasonable flex. Yeah. Because yeah, then it it feels like suspension. Yep. Which like you can use to your advantage, and and that's a perfect situation. That's a perfect example is when you're just like, like okay. Like some, like this morning, I like my legs are like shaking right now. Yeah. We weren't skiing powder skis this morning, but we were skiing some pretty challenging snow conditions. And honestly, like in situations like that where I get really tired, that's where I benefit from a ski like this. Yeah. Because there will come a moment where I'm just like, okay, I can't turn anymore. Take me to the bottom, and I just point the skis downhill and just let the ski absorb everything in front of it, and then I stop when I hit a groomer. The other thing I remember <laughs> about that day. Last year on the Black Ops was... You remember your lower national jibbing? I remember that. That was fun. But I also remember going past people very fast. Yeah. Like there was, like no one was even close. Yep. You know, it was just one of those days where you got the right thing for the right job. Yep. And you just let it go and, no, and people were flailing. Yeah. So. No, it's cool. It, and that's a fun conversation of like, when does a really heavy ski yeah. actually make the skiing easier yep and that that would be the scenario yeah and you can pretty much say the same thing for this next one you know it's very kind of that similar concept with this dina star m3 118 um, basically you know rosignol and dina star are sister companies but they're obviously building the skis differently the construction is pretty different but kind of they achieve very similar things with the speed and tension. Yeah, I feel like this has more freestyle influence yeah. in it, and this has more like free ride world tour influence in it. We're not dropping a ton in weight here, uh, 2419 in this Dina Star, so I think that this is the second heaviest ski on the wall. Um, and yeah, it's got some substance to it. I like to think of this as the people, the ski designers in Chamonix in France, looking up at the mountain and saying, what can we build to get from the top to the bottom as fast and as confidently as possible? Yeah. And that's where they come up with an M3 118. Um, we see a lot of these in free ride world tour competitive athletes, uh, kind of similar to what we're talking about with Unleashed and that kind of moving up on the chain of being something that these athletes are really enjoying uh, in these big mountain environments. And M3 118 certainly is that for, for Dina Star. Uh, they do use their hybrid core in here, so a poplar in the middle, the polyurethane on the outside. So you get that just incredible smoothness and quietness out of the build. That, that's the contrast between this and the Black Ops 118 is just that use of polyurethane just takes it a little bit lighter and a little bit smoother and just really keeps the ski kind of engaged and on edge, just slightly less playful and a little bit more business oriented. And then tip shape, we kind of alluded to this at the beginning. This is probably the sharpest tip shape up here. Um, and what that's gonna do is just cut through the snow, uh, as opposed to something like that Rosignol, which a little bit rounder, that less early taper. It's gonna float really well, but it's not gonna really just knife through and cut through. So that's where the smoothness of this and especially from like a powerful and aggressive standpoint, makes a lot of sense. But pretty cool stuff. You know, we really like that M3 108, uh, mainly because of the energy. It's one of the, one of the more poppy skis in that kind of shape and width range. Like we're yep. continually impressed with how well that thing turns. Yep. You just get a lot of good energy out of, out of it at, for being a 108. And that one's always felt particularly appropriate here in, in Vermont yep. too. Totally. Maneuverable, yeah. easy to use, yeah. but really rewarding as well. So lots of rocker in the front here. Pretty stiff camber. You know, you definitely feel that this is meant to be used in an aggressive standpoint. Uh, these athletes are really enjoying having the camber underfoot. I think you talked about it earlier. I can't remember what ski, but you have to have something to help grip when conditions degrade and and terrain gets technical. Yeah. So steeper, more technical terrain, really have to have a stiffer 
underfoot zone with some camber or else you're just going to wash out. Yeah. And that's not good, especially if you're kind of attacking the hill at a high rate of speed. In a potential no-fall zone. Totally. Like, you need to have something that's confidence-inspiring, and that's kind of where skis like this come in handy. So if you don't decamber it, you know, the, the rocker is average, and then it does pop out if you're decambering. So when you're weighting the ski, certainly has more of that rocker popping out. But another similar kind of round or sharper turn, uh, sorry, tail shape here at the, at the end. And again, that's just making it smoother on the backside and easier to release. But really the, the power is in this camber underfoot. So you're getting a lot of activity out of this ski. Yep. But pretty cool stuff. We got the weight. Turn radius, a little longer, 24. Yep. So that's another kind of outlier when you're looking down on the ski, not a whole lot of side cut going on here. Another similarity to black ops over here. Yep. Long, long turn shape. But aggressive ski, aggressive skiers. Again, you gotta deal with the weight when you're when you're moving it. Yep. So and that's kind of a difference between this one. Yeah, moving into like a slightly different world for these next three skis, I would say all three of these next skis are, are much more like freestyle inspired rather than like free ride world tour capable. Yep. Not to say that they're not capable, but I would I would say that most most skiers like that would would prefer something like M Free, a little bit more powerful, a little bit more stronger, and a little bit more trustworthy. This is the, the ski that started it all. The ski that inspired what is now a, a big collection of skis from Atomic. This is the Bent Chetler 120. Um, this ski uses the same ingredients as all the rest of the Bent skis, except it gets carbon stringers. So that's kind of the thing that separates this ski from particularly the 110. Obviously it's 10 millimeters wider as well, but there's a ton of similarities in their shape. This one just gets the carbon. So it's a little springier, a little bit more energetic, yep. just kind of takes the performance to the next level. And the price does tick up a little bit, but I think it's it's reasonable considering what you get out of this ski. Um, 1,850 grams. This is the light, this is the light one. I yeah. think it's the lightest. It's on gotta the be. Wall. Yep. So pretty darn lightweight, very playful shape that we'll look at in just a second here and a nice soft fun playful yep. shape this one's just easy going easy to ski super fun very very playful um, i mentioned that it is freestyle inspired and i think you can say that about chris chris ben chetler as a skier excuse me he just kind of he was one of the pioneers of kind of taking the park to the back country right. so to speak which is now um, a pretty common thing that you see athletes do uh, just kind of through their, their progression as skiers and their lifestyle. At some point you kind of like physically age out of park landings all the time and people are quick to realize that it doesn't hurt as much landing in powder. Right. So cool freestyle backcountry ski. Decent amount of tip rocker up here but not like crazy by length. You know again this is a ski that has a considerable amount of camber and that is necessary for what it's designed to do. We do get that horizon tech in the tips and tails in this ski. We talked about that when we were chatting about the Armada. So I think that like talk about like countering things and although it doesn't have as much rocker as some of these skis, yeah. the horizon tech like boosts its looseness in the tips and tails totally. and like it's almost like acting as rocker kind of, which is super interesting, I think. And then this is one of those skis that has a more symmetrical rocker profile, so a good amount of tail rocker back here if you're going to take off or land switch in the backcountry or, or just in soft snow somewhere. It doesn't necessarily have to be the backcountry. Um, so you can definitely see the kind of freestyle influence in its shape. Um, Bob, I get to go skiing with Chris Ben Chetler in like four weeks. Cool. So. I can only imagine that he'll be skiing these, and it'll be interesting to see it firsthand. Right. See the man himself taking his skis and, and doing what he wants to do on them. Yeah, no, I think that that is a nice opportunity, and like, I 
do like to see the athletes line up with their product. Me too. That's yeah. pretty awesome. It can give you like a fun sense of like why it exists. Right. Which I felt like Cole Richardson wasn't skiing the his ski out in Whistler, but at least like I felt like I got to see some of that. Right. Like, oh yeah, that's why your ski has a thirty meter turn radius because you're like the most athletic person I've seen in yeah. a month. Um, so, yeah, this ski is really cool. I love the backcountry freestyle application of it. I still think there's resort application here. I actually think that like this is a reasonable choice for just a powder ski. Yep. Like if you live out west, I think it's a bit wide for here, but if you live out west and you're looking for a really, really fun powder ski, it doesn't even matter if you're a freestyle skier or not. You don't have to ski switch on these things. They've got a big range of mount points, so you can go further back on the ski and get really good directional performance out of it. It's light, so it's not going to be tiring kind of for a big range of abilities. Like, you know, we don't talk about like intermediates in skis this wide very often, but if I was to point to one that I think an intermediate could get along with, okay, it would be this one. I think. Yeah, especially in the 120 and up zone. Yeah. No, and I feel like, I think the next ski is reasonable, but it's flat, and that right. makes it weird. Like, this could, this could be the last yeah. nor normal ski. Yeah, you might be right. And, like, it's, even not th it's not even that normal. No. It's kind of like... This was the last normal yeah. <laughs> ski. <laughs> but I do think that this one's a little bit more approachable and a little bit more well-rounded in its potential audience. Um, given what I know about, kind of, I used to ski uh, the automatic 102, you know, sure. with the carbon backbone. Yep. Um, given what I know about that and how it works, backland as well, um, I personally wish that build filtered into the narrower Me too. bent skis. I wish there was a little more pop. Me too. In those 110s and 100s and 90s. Yeah. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll get it someday. Yep. I certainly wouldn't be surprised to see this construction trickle down to the 110 at least. Right. I like throw a little carbon in that 110. I feel like it, it wouldn't take away from its like fun and smeariness. Like that ski's very soft. Yeah. But I think it would, it would add a little, a little something something. And then I, I I would worry a little bit about putting it into the 90 and 100 just from a pricing perspective. Yeah. Like if that if that ticked the price of those skis up a hundred dollars, then I, I think they would that would be a, a challenging decision to make for a, for a time. I know I'm being selfish. Yeah. I understand. I want what I want. <laughs> yeah. Like a like a Ripstick 88 Black Edition with no vapor tip. I know. How hard is that? Still, you're never <laughs> you're never gonna get it. Uh, and kind of an interesting transition into Jeff, our first Candide in a comparison. No, we had the 101. In the one, are you sure? In, in the, the twin wide, tips? In the wide twin tip. Well, I did, apologize. Did we not? No, maybe we didn't. I can't remember now. Oh, boy. I somehow don't you, think we did could because be right. they weren't, like, released Announced yet. yet. Yeah, maybe we, like, mentioned it in the narrow twin tip comparison. Either way. I don't remember. This is yeah, exciting. You're probably right. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> this is exciting. This is a Candide AK-121. Uh, this ski stands out from everything else on the wall. We used to be able to talk about it with Nocta. We can't do it anymore. Yeah. But having zero or reverse camber um, doesn't really exist uh, industry-wide anymore. I, like. It's funny to think about the transition between going from like vocal ones and twos and threes that were, were just all like, like yeah. super bowed out. They weren't out. even flat. They were full yeah. reverse camber, where at least this is flat yeah. for a s reasonable portion of the ski. Yeah, and Nocta used to be that way. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we do have the binding system binding plate on this one, so... Probably going to have to subtract 200 so grams. 2,100 2, probably. Yeah, so about 2,100 grams in this ski. Uh, we are built with that blend of Polonia and Poplar, so a little bit lighter, a little bit snappier. Carbon in here as well. Um, so we do get good energy out of the ski at a lighter weight. Um, but the big story here is how these things sit together. And the weight might keep it from pivoting naturally. There is still some friction. I don't know if... Yeah, just from being flat. If you can hear it. I but can hear it. The, uh, you know, the Nocta used to just spin. Yeah. 
you know, or those ones and twos used to spin, but flat, right underfoot, flat. Yeah. And then super long rocker. I mean, it starts here, yeah, um, and then goes all the way to the all the way to the tip, obviously. But uh, probably the most dramatic example of rocker on this wall here, from right back behind this binding plate here, uh, straight on through. So really, really interesting kind of way to build a ski. 149, 121, 141. So not truly symmetrical, but we're getting pretty similar. Yeah, uh, and it's got that triple radius. Triple radius. Too. Yeah, so flatter underfoot and a little bit turnier in the tips and tails. If you think about uh, Candide and how he skis, there's a lot of straight lining going on, yeah. but when he turns, it's incredibly round yeah. and very tail oriented. So you really get to see that push through the tails at the end of his turn, uh, creates some incredibly round turns. Or just go straight. Yeah. Really, really interesting skier. Um, and then you can definitely tell that there's that carbon in here with that flex in the feedback. Yeah, pretty snappy. You'd kind of expect it to be a little bit more bacon-ish in terms of that flex, but it's it's not. No, there's some stiffness there's to it. There's some stiffness to it, um, which I think plays really well against the, the flatter profile and just dramatic rocker. We skied these in the spring. I usually think that slush and spring conditions is a is not a close second, but it's the second the, best for testing a powder ski. Second best for testing a powder ski. I think that's fair. Um, and when you get on something that's this flat, you initially notice how easy it is to spin. Yep. So it's a very unique and very specific feel to these skis versus anything else on this wall where just shifting directions and being playful with the snow and the terrain is incredibly easy. Yep. Like how easy it is it to just Super get easy. this thing to spin. Like when it's almost, it's like you have to like adjust to it. Yep. Because it, it does, it'll, you'll just keep spinning around if you're not like ready to go straight again. Yeah. It's, it's pretty interesting. Um, I've had a lot of conversations with people about Candide skis because I think at this point, like, Weirdly, I've skied them more than like anyone other anyone than else in the country. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and I, I've had the same exact conversation with so many different people where they're like, how are the Candides? Like they must be like super stable and like really strong and powerful because yeah. like Candide skis really fast. And I think it's really important to remember that Candide is tiny. Like he's a very, very small person. Yeah. If I stood next to Candide, I would look huge. So. You have to remember that, and also that he's like the best skier ever. Right. So like when he's like straight lining through choppy snow conditions, he's benefiting from being the best skier ever and being like 125 pounds or something. Yeah. I don't know exactly how much he weighs, but I would guess significantly less than 150. And probably like 90 of it is in his legs. Right. Like talk about, you know, we've had that conversation with like leg strength to body weight ratio right. and how I'm a little bit further along that spectrum than most skiers, and then like Candide blows me out of the water right. for that, that ratio. So they're not like, don't, don't buy a Candide, any of them, but especially like the 111 and 121, because I think those are the skis that people would think about this with and expect that you will be able to straight line through moguls, because you are not Candide. Yeah, and like other than being slow and methodical and playful on these skis, I struggled otherwise. Sure. Like I yeah. had a hard time kind of getting it to feel comfortable at speed. Yeah. And that was, that's me. Yeah. So I had a tough time. Right, and you're like 100 pounds heavier than Candide. Right. But I you're really- two, You're almost two Candides. But if you view it from, from a playfulness and creativity yes. lens, this is just an incredible outlier in the ski industry. Yep. These days. Yep. I think so. Yeah, it's really cool to have. Um, and then next ski is the Vocal Revolt 121. Um, this ski's been around for a little while. I think you were you were referring to this as like Tanner Rainville's ski. Another one that falls on the category of incredible leg strength to body weight ratio. Yep. Unbelievable. So here's a fun thought. Would you say that this ski wouldn't exist without your expert coaching? 
I bet they would have figured it out <laughs> without me. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm getting oh, at? Oh, yeah, yeah. If it is Tanner Rainville's ski, yeah. sort of, it's not like on paper his pro model, you have coached Tanner Rainville, so through the transitive property of ski construction and coaching, you are 100% responsible for the existence of the Revolt 121. I like... I like your theory behind that, but he was doing backflips before he ever got to me, so I can't take, I'm not going to take that credit. Fair <laughs> enough. Um, I think it's a fun, fun thought. Uh, so this is a cool ski. Um, it's another one of those kind of freestyle inspired powder skis. You'll see a lot of vocal athletes like Tanner Rainville using this ski in the backcountry, hitting big backcountry jumps or, or hitting natural, natural hits and, and doing tricks off them. Can land switch on it. Um, there's there's a lot of cool things about this ski. I do feel like we're now into the, the category of like these things are a bit weird. Yeah, and you're really with this are not doing Eastern United States skiing justice. I don't think I don't think there's much much point yeah. to owning this if you live on the east side eastern side of the country. Um, I don't want to tell people that they can't do whatever they want because that's what's so fun about right. existence and individuality. But I, at least, probably wouldn't ski this. In fact, fun conversation. If I was shopping in the Revolt line for myself, I wouldn't go over the 104 for East Coast skiing. Yep. Because the 114 is like a different animal. That's like yep. a stiff kind of like big mountain charger ski. And then this, I think, is just unnecessarily wide. Where like actually the Revolt 104 is like fits right in. Pretty darn good yep. powder ski around here. So, anyways, simple build in this ski. All the Revolts are pretty simple in how they build them. Just a multi-layer wood core, some fiberglass, 2,300 grams. So not the heaviest ski that we've looked at so far, nor the lightest. Um, I think simplicity is like fair to say about yeah. the the construction. I think things get a lot more interesting looking at shape. So lots of tip rocker in this ski. One of those skis that has like a nice finish to the rocker too. Just Probably like the most splay. Extra, yeah. So you're going to get a ton of float. Um, really nice just having like that tip shape. It gives you a ton of confidence as a skier. Yeah. Like your tip's never going to die. Never going to die. Yeah, which is like very, a very nice feeling. Um, and then pretty long rocker back here in the tail. The thing that I find most interesting about the tail is the aggressive amount of early taper. Yep. So we'll actually see something similar with the pescado, where with the swallow tail that's allowing the ski to kind of sink in the tail. This is basically doing the same thing by taking out surface area in the back of the ski here and pairing it with that rocker, letting the ski sink a little bit. And also the, the aggressive taper here is, is allowing for a lot of edge release. Yep. So it gives this ski a very, very surfy, smeary, slashy feel. It's one of those modern, new school, free ride powder skis and a very even, round flex pattern. There are much softer skis up here, but take the rocker profile on this ski and with a pretty even flex pattern like that, and if you want to do like nose butters over a, a roller in deep in the back country, the ski is, is one of the best choices. So I think pretty simple. There's not a ton of frills here. It is an interesting giant powder ski. Yeah, they definitely do the dramatic shaping justice you yeah. know, with, with that rocker, that tip splay, you know, that, that taper in the front, excuse me. Well, it feels important too. It's another one of those things where like they're countering the heft of the yeah. build. Like if they just if you took this construction and just made like like more like that candide shaping from yeah. a side cut perspective or a taper perspective, then it would be it would feel a lot more like this. Where with this shape it feels more playful. Yeah, I mean it's a substantial ski from yep. a heft and construction standpoint. Yeah. But yeah, the the, the rocker and the profile certainly make it stand out and yep. be a different thing. Yeah, super important. Um, I'm going to give you this one. I want that one still. Okay. Because I just want to double check down here. I don't think you're going to get a radius off of it. No, I'll find it and put it on the screen. Neither short nor long. Looks in the middle. Just because that side cut starts pretty low. 
I'm going to say it again. I kind of wish they would build these in, in Europe. Yeah. I know I've said that before, and, and I know like I've had this conversation with people from Vocal, and like they want to also. They they literally don't have like the production um, capabilities right. to do all of their skis out of their current European factories. But I at least feel like I don't really care with the 96 or the 104. But I feel like when you get up to here, if you were able to build it with slightly more advanced construction, it might take some of the weight out, and I think that that could be a, a beneficial thing for this ski. All right. But it's like, these are superficial wishes. Yeah. Fun stuff, though. Uh, Black Crow's Nocta gets a redo for this year. Kind of what we talked about with the Candide and how the Nocta used to be the one that was fully rockered, now we have camber. Yep. So that's one of the big changes uh, for this year. A um, little bit different of a construction, they've added Polonia to the core, so it does lighten the ski a little bit. It's poplar and Polonia uh, mixed with fiberglass in there. So It's a lot lighter than I would have guessed. Yeah, just over 2,000 grams, 2040 uh, in this 185. And what you're getting now is a little bit more energy, a little bit more mobility um, from just an edge-to-edge -edge standpoint. The older Nocta was very much like that Candide where you were spinning and floating and drifting. Um, this one has a little bit more pop and pep to it, which is just a nod to what Black Crows is doing in terms of building energetic and engaging skis. Uh, really, really interesting tip and tail design here. Um, really just matching that chevron style to the graphic. I can't really think of much of a structural benefit here other I've, than... I've been hung up on that for a while now. You're lightening the swing weight, I guess. I'm going to go with durability if you ski into a wall. Is better? Yeah. With this? Yeah. Okay. Because you just it's like sidewall material. Yeah. Yeah. My theory yesterday was making these sharp blades and then skiing through underbrush and uh, yes, and, I like and trimming. I like that yeah. too. I'm concerned about the the safety of that. Me too. But that's <laughs> <laughs> that's where my mind goes. I'd also be concerned about the safety of skiing into a wall. D totally. Yeah, both of these things are not good ideas. <laughs> Um, pretty long rocker, you know, they're not completely taking the flotation out of it by adding camber. Um, you know, pretty long rocker, decent splay. I think maybe if you added um, the very end of this tip would have some competition with greatest amount of splay yeah. between Nocta and that well, Revolt. There's actually some like, some reasonable similarities between those two skis. Yep. And I was actually kind of like laughing at myself as I was talking about wanting a Revolt 121 that's built in Europe. So like this one. Because it's basically yeah. just that. <laughs> and that's a lot more expensive. Right. So kind of just an interesting give and take. Yeah. Um, tail rocker, pretty similar to what we see in the front. Uh, 19 meter turn radius in this one. So they, I, that's part of that, that taper. So widest part is brought well down, so you're not dealing with a whole lot of area in which to put in the side cut, and they do kind of shape it rather dramatically. Um, I, you know, we found last year that these were really fun to ski. Again, springtime, but in that softer, more mushy snow, uh, these things turned really well. You could get these up on a high edge angle and really get them to come around. Yeah, like surprisingly responsive yeah. for how big it is. Yep. Um, I think, like, obviously the 19 meter turn radius helps a lot in that regard, but yeah, I mean, for how good it is in, like, true deep powder, yeah. it's pretty darn well rounded, too, which feels weird to say about a ski that's 122 underfoot. Yeah, really playful and nice and consistent through the flex. Yeah. So I think that's a really interesting aspect and when you're dealing with something that's has this blend of weight and shape uh, that's where we're getting those higher edge angles and kind of yep. that comfort level uh, in a carved turn as opposed to just something that can drift and smear which these also can do. Um, having spoken to many Black Crows athletes about the new Nocta 
they are all very, very excited about it. Yeah. So kind of another athlete, maybe not athlete driven from its production, but athlete focused. Yeah, and there's something special and unique about that fully rockered Nocta that doesn't exist anymore. The outgoing one. Um, but I think that this is more appealing to more skiers. I agree. Yep. Yep. Probably not a great East Coast application, despite us having fun on it. I think they've got a couple other skis that are better East Coast powder skis. Yep. Atris. Even, even Anima. Still pretty darn wide, but... I'd probably rather, actually, I don't know, because Nocto is a little more surfy than Anima. We're getting into the weird zone here. Here, you take that I'll one. take this one. Yeah, so even though we're not, like, much wider, in fact, I, I find a lot of similarities between this ski and the, and the Revolt 121, but it does feel like we're, we're getting pretty weird here in, in the Reckoner 122, and there are some differences between this and, and the Revolt as well. Um, so this is the K2 Reckoner 102. 122. So, what are that two? I said 102. 102. It's because I was talking to K2 yesterday yeah. about, about Reckoners. Um, so, excuse me, Reckoner 122. The 102 would be like 100 yards that way oh, yeah. on this wall. Um, 122, it uses the same construction. So the big thing in this ski is the carbon spectral braid, but we also get carbon boost braid. Carbon spectral carbon boost. braid and carbon boost braid. Yeah. Anyways, so there's the cross hatching carbon in this ski, which in the Reckoners, I really like the way that they do this because that weave is looser in the tips and tails and tighter underfoot, so you get more torsional stiffness underfoot. Torsional stiffness in a ski that's 122 arguably yeah. doesn't matter, right. but it still is cool and like it, it, you can still feel it in the construction or in the performance. And then that carbon boost is just the longitudinal carbon stringers that give this ski a little bit more snap than if those weren't there. 2,180 grams. So honestly, for being 122 underfoot, that's pretty lightweight. Not quite as light as that Nocta, but not tremendously heavy either. And then you saw a little bit of the flex, but that's like, that's the true flex. This is easily one of those super super soft skis might not be the softest ski on the wall but it's pretty darn close yeah i mean it's reckoner through and through i mean yeah. that is consistent all the way down yep. through the narrower models yep so very very soft flex pattern if you recall when we were talking about the revolt 121 a lot of its playfulness came from the aggressive shaping in the taper yeah where with this ski, it's, it's more coming from the soft flex and like really the skis are basically designed to do the same thing. They're both freestyle inspired powder skis that athletes are gonna take into the backcountry, land switch on, take off switch, do like big slashy high speed turns and stuff like that. Yeah. So it's just interesting seeing manufacturers achieve not the same thing, but achieve a similar thing, one doing it through shaping and one doing it more through construction. So still a decent amount of tip rocker in this ski. You know, that's like, it's a lot of tip rocker. It's a lot of rocker in that <laughs> ski, like, yeah. This is the only collection of skis where like, that's not just in comparison, a right. lot of tip rocker on this wall. It's like a, a decent amount of tip rocker. Um, and then this does have more of a symmetrical rocker shape. It really is, you know, the Reckoner line is a freestyle inspired line, a freestyle focused line. So. Good amount of tail rocker back here. You can land switch and powder on it, or at least the ski can land switch and powder. Right. Landing switch and powder is very, very hard to do. Um, and this ski, once again, they don't list the turn radius. The What's radius eludes these? you. The radius just is like, they don't care. Is it on like, the sticker on, on the, the back? Sticker? No sticker? Yes, 23.7. Yeah. I was going to guess 24, and I wish I had, because then I would have sounded really smart. I would have guessed that you would have cheated and looked at it first and oh. pretended. Um, anyways, so I actually feel like because it has that softer flex pattern, it skis like it has a bit of a shorter turn radius. Than, yeah, I mean, you, you know, can access it for like sure. What was the turn radius of... Uh, we're 25 here. What were we in M3? This is 24... Yeah, so yeah, this 24. is very, very close to M-free radius, but with this with this flex, you can 
even if even in soft snow, like even in like really light soft snow, you can still get the ski to bend, and then yeah. you're gonna you're getting get it to make a shorter turn. But super fun. I would I would love to own a Reckoner 122. I that's that one catches my eye too as being a really good option. It'd for, just be so much fun for the right conditions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's got that blend, you know. And we talked about it with Mindbender, where it's mixing, you know, a little bit of stability and a little bit of power with yep. a good amount of playfulness. Yep. I feel like this any stability and power in this is just coming from the sheer amount of material. Yep. Totally. And we found this to be true about the 102 and the 112 as well, that you can bend it and really make some nice turns. Yeah, I think especially on the 102. Because the 102, you get a little bit more torsional stiffness and yeah. then like get it onto firmer snow and you can really like get it to make this cool, just snappy, snappy round, round yeah. turn. Um, taking it up a notch in the weirdness category, we have this line Pescado. Uh, part of their swallowtail discussion and line of skis. Yeah, look at that. It almost doesn't fit on the scale. I know. I noticed that earlier. you got to be pretty hey, careful. Hey, look at that. Lightest ski. 1,770 grams. It's not quite fair because it's also the shortest. It's the shortest, and it has a big it chunk it's cut it's out of miss, it. It's missing the rest yeah, of its tail. It's missing a lot. Um, so really interesting shape uh, on this one. Um, lighter weight wood core. We are seeing some maple brought into here, so there is some flex to it, uh, kind of like what we talked about with bacon. Um, but just really about as dramatic and creative as you're going to see in ski construction and design out there today. Um, Line does does this a lot, and we talked yep. about this. They are not too interested in what everyone else is doing. They want to do things that they think are interesting, and that kind of makes them stand out as a brand. And it also makes kind of each individual ski experience different and engaging in its own way. You know what they say on their website? They say this is the best powder ski in the world. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to argue with that. It's, it, yeah, it's just, I, I think that's like a yeah. cool reflection of line. They're yep. very bold. Yeah. You know, make bold statements. I like it. Yeah. Uh, 158, 125, 144. So massive dimensions on this ski. A huge shovel. Huge shovel. Uh, I think it's a shorter radius. This is another one we're going to have to pop up on, on, the, uh, on the video here. But the Swallowtail, and you talked about this earlier. I forget which ski. Oh, gosh. Uh, tapered tail. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> At any rate, it allows you to be more in the rear of the ski. Revolt? I think it was Revolt. Maybe Revolt. It allows you to be more in the rear of the ski yeah, while this keeping... this is doing it a lot more than taper. Yeah, this is like to the nth degree. Yeah. Um, so more rearward, rearward stance on this thing. Yeah. This line is pretty far Aggressive, back. Aggressively far back. Yeah, you're able to keep a longer effective edge stay a little bit back, keep that shovel going up, and just surf. Yeah. And that's the whole point here, is that you're set farther back in the ski to make the tails more maneuverable and keep that surfy aspect of the ski uh, as a clear highlight. Yeah, talk about not worrying about your tips diving. Yeah, and there's quite a bit of rocker here as well, so low really smooth long splay here combine that with that 155 in the shovel and again it's not it's not sinking yep um interestingly just like the sakana it carves really well even though it's 125 underfoot i know it's super weird how they do these it's things it's almost like skiing two mono skis um when you look at a snowboard like a fishtail snowboard a lot of influence a lot of influence really interesting because the rocker basically or the camber basically goes to where the swallowtail starts yeah so it's a really when you look at these these new fish style snowboard i don't, I don't want to say new but fish style snowboards where the bindings are set back super short tail uh, they're pretty cambered back there as well so you're really relying on the energy of that to keep you kind of stable and grounded. Um, and there's just not a whole lot of material back here, so it just cuts through super smooth. Yeah. There's nothing to hang up, yeah. uh, which is why this is such an interesting and effective design when it comes to powder skis. 
Uh, but yeah, really specific, interesting flex. Like it's soft, it's light. Yep. Um, you're not really, I don't think like aggression and charging is a big part of this ski's personality. No, I think it's more finesse. Yeah, as opposed to, you know, an M3 118, which is designed and built for high speeds and straight lines. Uh, like you said, finesse and yep. sophistication are big yep. parts of this ski's charm and character. Yep, I agree 100%. But pretty cool stuff, and if they say it's the best powder ski on the world, who are we to argue? They can say whatever they want. They can say whatever they want. They built them. Yeah. Um, I like how that ski is like really achieving a lot of float, that Pescado. Mm -hmm. And this ski is two, but it does it in such a different way. So we're up to 129 underfoot here. And for dimensions, we're 149, 129, 137 with a 30.5 meter turn radius. Yes. So this ski is huge underfoot and really like where the Pescado is designed to sink in the tail. This is designed for the entire thing yep. to plane out um, on top of the snow surface, and, and it should plane out even at pretty darn slow speeds, I would say. Um, I've often thought of this as like a heli skiing ski. It's like an Alaska heli skiing ski, and like there's not a huge application for it outside of that. No, you have to be in the right spot. You know, yep. I think the, the combination of of the build. I mean, it is almost 2,400 grams. This is the 189, but, um, you know, it's pretty heavy. It's on the stiffer side of the spectrum as well. I think it's on the stiffest side of the spectrum. Yeah, probably. And on this wall, um, carbon flip core, things built like a real, a real ski. Yep. Um, which is really interesting. You know, we've seen yeah. a lot of like very soft flexing skis up here, and this is just completely different in its concept. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's easy to see why that would be an ideal choice for wide open, bottomless yeah. on track. Go big, like go fast go and make fast. huge, yep. sweeping, giant powder turns. Yep. Like an Alaska face. Yeah, totally. Not that I have like a tremendous amount of experience skiing big faces in Alaska, but I can only imagine if I did have that experience and I did it on a spur, I would have had a great time. Probably. I would imagine <laughs> you would. Um, so. Anyways, 30.5 meter turn radius, very stiff, almost 2,400 grams, 2,350 we'll call it. Um, so it's important to remember all those things. And then, you know, we've talked a lot about how like manufacturers are like countering things. And I think like in this ski, it's really interesting because they basically counter it by like almost making it perfectly flat. There's not much camber down here, like at all. And then there's, very like low splay so it's like it's just interesting because it like almost feels more like a surfboard to me when i like yeah. think about the spurs performance and how it feels when you ski it is it's like you're just like you're utilizing very aggressive taper both in the tip and the tail to get all of your maneuverability and then the rest of the ski is just stiff and strong and stable. Yep. So it's like, it's completely the opposite of a Reckoner 122 in like how it skis and, and kind of what it's designed to do. But yeah, if you're looking to ski pretty fast through really deep snow and big wide open terrain, there honestly isn't anything that's like considerably better than a spur. There's not a whole lot of comparables out there. No. Um, another interesting thing about the spur is that it comes in short lengths. Yeah, So like, like really a 159, yeah. you can get that thing in. Yeah. Um, so that just kind of opens up that aspect to smaller skiers. Yeah. How many do you think they sell? 50? I don't know. Yeah, I'd say like 100 maybe. I'm sure like a heli or a cat skiing group hat has bought a fleet. You know what I'm, I've never noticed? There's, um, there are sparkles in the blue. Yeah, I've never noticed that. Now I want one. <laughs> Remember the old spurs? Yes. That had like the they were asymmetrically Boy, do I. Yep. I like those spurs. Those are pretty cool. This is my favorite spur. Yeah. Through the progression of the spur. 
Um, but that one's pretty weird. And for for years, this has been the end of our powder discussion. Yeah, but I was, I was giving you a nice segue, and that one's pretty weird. So then you could say this one's really weird. Yeah, uh, this is the new K2 Crescendo, and I like to think that since the marker, the royal family of bindings, comes with a 132 millimeter break, that they K2 said okay. We're going to make a ski that's 132 underfoot because that's what the brake goes up to. Sure. And that's where this ski came from. Sure, now that they're under the Elevate umbrella yeah. and like Marker is their binding company. Yep. So I like that concept. That's, that's my conspiracy theory for the end of the wall. Yeah, you know, a lot of similarities to the spur. Totally. Uh, so yeah, 132 underfoot in this K2 Crescendo. Uh, they do use a blend of aspen and polonia wood. You gotta like keep it light somehow. There's yep. gotta be some offset. Yep. 2100 grams, so 200 grams lighter than the spur over here. Yep. Uh, they also get to use K2's carbon spectral braid, so they do put that uh, carbon application in here. Uh, Jeff, this is a fully capped ski. I know it's really interesting. Really interesting that they would that they would do that. It kind of makes sense to me. Yeah. And as a powder ski. Yep. Like, what do you need a sidewall for, I right, guess? Right. I was going to bring that up um, way back here. And I was going to say, what do you need edges for? Right. And then I was like, oh, people are going to make fun of me. But right. what do you need sidewalls for? What do you need edges for in a ski that's 132 under foot? Like, right. what are you going to do on it other than ski really deep powder? Remember right. when Shane McConkey like, side slipped the spine on water skis? You're right. He proved that like, you can ski powder without edges. Yep, and really so, fast. Yeah, so yeah, I think that that's fun to point out, and also it's going to increase its durability. And I feel like the crescendo is the type of ski that like you buy once in your life. Right. Like you, you could buy a crescendo and just hang on to it forever, and it's going to last a really long time because it's built durably. Are you ever going to need a wider ski than this for right. anything? Right. You just you just put it in your closet for that special yep. powder trip. And if you live and ski in a place where this is a normal thing, then, then you figured something out, and that's great. Yeah. You know, like Japan, deep snow, trees, or like stuff Alta like that. Or like Alta last year. Yeah. You could see somebody skiing that ski a lot when you get however many inches of snow they got. A lot. 800 something. Yeah. But you do need that in yep. order to fully maximize the potential of something like this. I think that 100%. So a lot of rocker. You can actually see, like, there's a tiny contact point here between the rocker and the camber. It's yeah. like two centimeters long, which I think is pretty interesting, just showing how uh, creative they are with their shaping. It's a little bit longer of a contact point in the tail, but again, your edges, as much as you don't need them, are for basically not in contact with the snow. Right. Um, and just that long tail rocker in the back as well. Um, Pretty dramatic in that tail taper here as well. So if you draw that line straight from the widest point, you're dealing with a good amount of taper length between um, the widest part of the ski and the narrowest part. So that's going to give you some good mo mobility and maneuverability, which you kind of need in something like this. 22 meter turn radius. There's less taper in the shovel. This is more yeah. uh, bulbous. Kind of bulbous in the shovel here and then more sharp in the tail, which yep. um, similar to what we talked Pescato. about with Pescado, uh -huh. you're really increasing that, that mobility and your, your capabilities of making uh, you know, easier turns in deeper snow. So pretty interesting stuff uh, from K2 with this crescendo. Yeah, super interesting. Um, and a little like, it's a little there's, softer than spur. A little softer than spur. Yeah. But there's something here. There's. It's still pretty stiff. Yeah. Like it's still. If you were to like, if you were to organize this wall by softest to stiffest, that would be very much near the end. Yeah. Near the stiffer skis, and and for the exact same reasons why we described why the spur is on the stiffer side is like when you have aggressive shaping like this, the yeah. ski itself can be stiff. So. And like the polonia that they use, like polonia is deceptively stiff. Yep. For yep. how light it is. Yep. Exactly. Um, Bob, the crescendo concludes our 2024 ski comparison series. Cool. The How widest fitting. thing ever. The widest ski 
No, maybe no, that no. we've talked about in a comparison. I don't remember ever going wider than that. No, and maybe we have, but we, I don't. What did we talk about in top five remember. last week? That the 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 the, the atomic X9S at sixty five and a half point five or something yeah. millimeters is yep. half as wide as, as a, a crescendo. crescendo. Yep. So pretty cool. Yep. Um, so yeah, that's it. This was a really interesting conversation. I think there's just there's a lot like interesting is a good word to describe all yep. of these skis because I think when you get up into this category you you start seeing some some fun variances and shape and it's just like it's cool to see all the different ways you can make a good powder ski especially since this is like how much attention this gets for being like a fringe yeah aspect yeah well, it's like the magazine skis. Right. It's the ski movie skis. Yeah. So, like, this category actually gets a lot of attention. Yeah. So, that was fun. Let us know if you have any questions. Um, keep your eye out for a bunch of fun on snow reviews. We've got some in-studio reviews to do soon. So, yeah, we're really, now that comparison series is wrapped up, we're going to dive right into the rest of what we do. Yep. Sounds good to me. So, let us know if you have any powder ski questions, and we will talk to you soon. Bye.